thriving, miners tirelessly gather the ore from which some of the finest weapons are made. We've taken the opportunity to arm ourselves, to go back out there, to reclaim our land. But something has changed. Bards sing tales of lands altered by energy itself. Vast golden steps teeming with life. Untrodden swamps laden with color. Glacial blue mountains. The meadows of the highlands. Got a weird one here. You've probably been enticed in by the title. Uh, I am currently in a call in Discord with four other players. Now, I don't really know any of you guys, but you're all wizards with the Guild Wars economy and you've approached me and you want to talk Six about making five. gold. Uh, one of you is the richest person in Guild Wars. So can I do something very tacky right now just to get everyone excited in the video? MM, how much money do you have right now? And what's your peak? Our peak is 1.7 million with gold. Okay. Currently sitting about like 1.5, so slight drop but still a drop in the bucket yeah that's a hell of a lot of money okay most people watching this video probably have never had like over a thousand gold let alone millions of gold okay the other question i want to ask you is with how much money you have do you know who like the second best is in terms of like because i'm guessing you you know you're the richest because of guild wars efficiency right so do, are you like a huge step above are you just like okay? so there is a, a few people who have hit the million uh, liquid gold mark where they have million gold worth of stuff they could you know trade and sell on the trading post there's one guy who's still active he's actually in our guild his name is Skijol um, he's worth about close to two million as well well welcome welcome do you guys remember at launch in 2012 or a couple of months just after when people started crafting their first legendary items people realized that there were these mysterious mystic forge recipes that required you to do an obscene amount of stuff and finally you could end up with a legendary weapon i actually think that guild wars 2 did the idea of legendaries really well they were hard to get especially at launch and they were extremely flashy well many years on it turns out there's a lot more to do so i've kind of done a bit of a clickbaity uh, title or I intend to title and uh, thumbnail for this video because really w I'm making this video for a lot of those X players and old players who haven't been keeping an eye on the game who may be wondering just what legendaries look like in Guild Wars 2 now what it means to have legendaries as the echelon has continued to be pushed and the amount of stuff you need to get has gone up and up and up because it's actually now true and I started working on this project a couple of months ago it's now true that you can pretty much have a full legendary character that is all your weapons can be legendary your trinkets your armor the lot and there's actually a huge amount to go into with that it's not something I really pursued for a long time I'm more interested in a lot of the other unlocks in the game but starting about in November ish I decided hey I'd go for it this has only actually been possible for a little while it was earlier in the year that the two final trinkets were added and in today's video I want to show you guys what they all look like and what it meant to collect them also where the game might go in the future now to anyone looking at this character right now and thinking oh that looks kind of crap but don't worry n none of this is legendary I was planning on shooting the the video in like a cool prestige looking area here at the library but then I realized I'm not actually going to be demonstrating this stuff on my original main that's this character here Liss the reason for that is because if you're going to go full legendary you need to deal with underwater stuff too and an elementalist only has one underwater weapon so that would be cheating instead of showing off on this character who has access to the library then we're going to go to another one who I've got everything set up on let's have a look so uh, what you're now looking at is a fully legendary character if I unsheath my weapons you'll see an absolute explosion of effects and various things floating and hovering around the character uh, which I'm gonna dive through what all of this is as we go forward and I'll show you that again uh, There's kind of a big thing with legendary items that and on the moment of unsheathing they play an effect And when you have enough of them, it means you get kind of a, a bit of a ridiculous light show uh, There's actually a lot further you can go with the cosmetics here as well But I'm being restrained what I'm really only and I know this doesn't look restrained But what I'm really only showing you is the gear itself I'm not doing any weird infusion based stuff, which we will get to 
but just a little bit later on in the video. So let's open up our equipment panel. Uh, and see what we've got. Well, first of all, you've got the armor on the left, and this is legendary, has a specific process to go through it. Uh, if you look at the tooltips, they're all massive. I've just done that for the purpose of the video. It's not really a, a real build. Uh, we have four legendary weapons here, split across two generations. You had the first set of legendary weapons, like this here, Frostfang was the first generation, and then the second gen, which all the other ones I actually currently have equipped are. Uh, then we have trinkets. Each trinket has its own story and area of acquisition uh, that's completely unique. It's not like a whole set got released at once, like you saw with the armor. Uh, they all have kind of very, very bespoke areas to acquire them. And then finally, two underwater legendaries and an aqua breather we'll get to in a moment. And then there's the, the gathering tools too, which we can talk about. So why would you do this, first of all? Well, cosmetics is one thing. Uh, I think the purest uh, Guild, Wars 2, uh, Guild Wars franchise players, I should say, really only care about the cosmetics. The point is you shouldn't really be stat crept on anyone else. You shouldn't have any benefits over other people. That's not really true in Guild Wars 2 anymore. Uh, there is a big benefit for doing this and that's that when you get legendary gear you get a couple of perks first of all you can slot runes or sigils or any kind of upgrade you like in and out of it for free you don't have to salvage you don't have to destroy items you don't have to use upgrade extractors from the gem store you can freely put things in and out but also you can at any time change the stats or the nature of the item itself there's actually a new bit of UI some of you guys out of touch with the game might not have seen is the customized panel so here I will customize my legendary chess piece for example and really a lot of this is only available to me because I'm legendary and so you've actually you can see here that there's three different things I can customize first of all the legendary item stats itself so here I have celestial stats which means I get a bit of everything in the game or I could choose to make it berserkers if I like and if I click this button it becomes berserkers at absolutely no cost. It's just the time it took me to do that. Uh, and I could do that on every piece. So that's actually a huge benefit for people that play long term and want to shuffle their builds around. If you play a lot of World vs. World, which I've been doing recently on Mesmer uh, or on any class you like, and you like to tinker and try new stat sets, you want to try different varieties of Condi or power or whatever, you can constantly be swapping this stuff. So one of the main advantages to going full legendary is that you can build craft for free without the cost, you know, the, the heavy cost that might be associated with other stuff. Like some of these stat types might only be found in certain areas with certain currencies of an expansion that's super irritating to get, takes a ton of bank space. Well, with the customized panel, you don't have to worry about that anymore. And it is every single stat in the game, as you can see. Also, if you do start getting lots of legendary items, there's actually this checkbox here as well. So because I have all the armor, if I'm full Celestial, which you saw at the start of the video, if I want to go full Carrion now, or Cavaliers... Their kind of fast food is a little less healthy than ours. Oh yeah, I'm on a roll! Welcome back to the introduction series where I run you through each of the classes and elite specializations in Guild Wars 2. Today we're looking at what is in my mind the original, the first and foremost, the most basic concept out there in fantasy RPGs, the warrior. The warrior is one of the original eight classes in the game and one of the earliest ones we knew anything about. It was unveiled second of all after only the elementalist first. So in a lot of ways, the design of the warrior exhibits Guild Wars 2 at its purest, where skill animations were extremely clean and roles were very well defined. A big part of the warrior is its access to a massive arsenal of weapons. Don't forget, one of the big changes with the MMO was that we would have our skills bound to the weapon we are wielding, and so the devs wanted to design and introduce to us nice and early a character that would still have a ton of main hand weapon customization because they have just such a wide range of things to choose from. And even to this date, with the new elite specializations in the game, the warrior remains the class with the access to the most weapons. I think the theme of the class should be pretty clear. You are the brute on the front line. You are the soldier. You are right up there getting down and dirty with the enemies. No tricks, no excessive use of fancy magics. Just you, your armor, your weapons, and your battlefield prowess. The warrior is capable of a great many things. 
Like all classes in Guild Wars 2, I would say it's generally well balanced. You're never going to feel bad playing this class. You're never going to be going through the core regular content in the game and feeling like it's too difficult for you. The warrior will always be capable of dealing with this stuff. As for specific meta functionality, how well does the warrior do in raids and dungeons? Just as with all the other classes, it does fine. You will be able to find a slot. As for specific capabilities, well, that changes regularly based on current skill balance. There's no point me talking about it here, as it will probably be out of date by the time a lot of people get to the video. So just as with the rest of the series, I'm not going to bother. What I will say is the warrior usually excels at not only doing its own damage, but enhancing the damage of its allies too, with its banner skills we'll go over in a second and mass spamming of might and fury offensive boons the warrior is a durable class it is of the heavy armor category one of only two classes to be heavy at launch and also on top of that it has a high health pool too some of the highest health you can get in the entire game innately for free honestly i'm always quite jealous and surprised when i log in on my warrior and start playing it finding just how comfortable I am, as opposed to some of the more squishy caster classes out there. I will say, don't make the mistake of thinking of the warrior as a noob class, or overly basic. Mastering the warrior can actually take a lot of finesse, particularly because of how movement-oriented Guild Wars 2's combat is, and a lot of the time, you want to be in there close, chasing after things that are dodging and moving away. Especially when you bring the elite specializations into the class too, I would say it's definitely not just something for beginners and bad players. Though it is a pretty good place to start. I would say most other classes should try to aim to be more like the warrior. Easy to pick up, hard to master. Well, with the basics divulged, let's get in game and have a look. Right, so for this first section, let's talk a little bit about the warrior unique profession mechanic. Obviously, there's a lot unique about it, the way in which it accesses downstate, the way in which it uses all of its skills. But we do also have a totally unique mechanic, that's adrenaline. Uh, and adrenaline is lifted above our skill bar. No matter what type of warrior you're playing, you will have adrenaline available. Uh, and so the idea here is that as we attack enemies, this resource builds. We get angry and angrier, filled with more adrenaline, and then we can trade that resource off for benefits, usually in the form of a burst skill. So every single weapon for the warrior actually has six skill slots. You have an auto attack chain of three skills. You've got all the other abilities up to five, as with all classes, but the warrior, the master of weapons, gets a six. And this changes based on the weapon you have equipped. So right now, as you can see, I have a greatsword. We'll go through the greatsword skills in another section. But greatsword also gets arcing slice here. And you'll see it says it's a burst. And the, the tooltip's rather large. And the reason for that is that the more adrenaline we have, the harder our burst skills will hit. So here, I'll show you guys what I mean by that. We're going to come over to these dolly acts. And the damage numbers and stuff here, we're not in level 80 zone, so they're not going to be as high as you might otherwise expect. But the idea here is, as we attack, if you watch, I'm just going to auto-attack, but we'll see this bar's filling. We got, and eventually, we've actually filled a segment of adrenaline. You see this here? And now we're going to fill another segment of adrenaline. There you go, the second one. Each time we fill a segment, you'll see that the, the skill here, the burst skill, kind of flips over, and it charges up. So now I'm at max adrenaline. And every time I attack, I can't gain over the max. So now I'm basically not gaining any value out of the mechanic. So what I want to do is spend that adrenaline on my burst skill. So that's bound to the hotkey Q for me. I think by default it's F1. And you'll see we spin around and we just killed a couple of them, did a ton of damage. The adrenaline goes away and now we can build it up again. And so through our specializations and our traits, we can augment this in any number of ways. Right now, you'll see I actually already have a trait on, in, written in blue there. I'm actually getting some endurance back every single time I use this. So I can dodge roll, use this, and then possibly get a dodge roll really quickly soon as well afterwards. So, you know, as with many of the professions, a ton of the traits are going to augment how this, this mechanic works. But that's the basic idea. Now, if I weapon swap, and now we've got dual wielding swords out, you'll see that the burst skill has changed again. The burst skill only cares about your main hand weapon in the case of dual wielding. So, if I unequip my second sword here, we only have one sword, but we still have the burst skill, you see? And so, the reverse is true as well. If we only have an offhand sword, you'll see the entire adrenaline user interface has gone away. It's like adrenaline doesn't exist for us anymore because we don't have a main hand. 
Now, in general, in Guild Wars, you never run around without a main hand, so this doesn't matter, but it is an interesting little quirk. And because the Warrior, as I've already explained, has access to so many weapons, that means there's a ton of burst abilities that you also get. Really, the idea that the Warrior is the master of weapons you can see now. So that's the idea of the unique mechanic. I'm going to go through all the weapon skills in the next section, and we'll just talk about the sixth ability, the burst one, as we do so. If I apply these eight opportunities by lunch, I can average 20 a day, 100 a week, 400 a month. I just can't sleep, or eat, or leave the garage. Ever. At ZipRecruiter, we know job searching can be a time-consuming process. So we built technology that does a lot of the work for you. It finds the right jobs and makes applying easy. And we actively pitch you to employers so you stand out, helping you discover the opportunities you deserve. Go to ZipRecruiter.com and put ZipRecruiter to work for you. Yo! Sorry, I, I was... Uh... Yeah, whatever. Don't forget to buff those scratches out, okay? That's my guy. Everyone has a chance for glory in Raid Shadow Legends. Download for free. Hey there guys, I usually start my videos with a short clip of me and some other players fighting a raid boss, and in this video it is not any different, however I did never really make a video about raids in Guild Wars 2, so this video is going to be a beginner's guide to get started in raids. Raiding is my favorite game mode in Guild Wars 2, I love everything about it, the rotations, the pressure that a raid boss can put on your team, and of course the teamwork. Raiding can be overwhelming and I do think that casual and even more dedicated players are put off by raiding. The learning curve might be a bit too high, or they can can't find a group that fits their current experience in raiding. Players might feel that the gap between open world PvE and raids is just too big. Back when the first raid wing, the Spirit Veil, was released, raiding was considered extremely difficult for some players. But since then, years have passed, multiple raid wings have been released and overall people have become more experienced and now I think everyone should be able to play raids. And before you go into the comments and say that people that raid are toxic, keep it cool. I will try to help you out and find a group that fits your current raiding experience. 
experience. Raiding in Guild Wars 2 isn't so much about dealing the most damage, it is more about knowing the mechanics of each boss. So, if you know the mechanics of a raid boss, then you have already come a long way. In this video I'm going to explain the basics of raiding in Guild Wars 2. I'm going to cover profession difficulty, choosing a build, the importance of your rotation, gear, finding a group and learning the boss mechanics. Also, to start raiding you will need the Heart of Thorns expansion and it would really be helpful if you also have the Path of Fire expansion. I'm not going to discuss every raid boss mechanic, those deserve a video on their own. It is best to read up on a guide or watch a video dedicated for that specific raid boss. This video is only going to focus on the basics and what you need to get started. As usual with my lengthier videos, you can find the timestamps in the video description. Alright, let's get into the video. Why would you want to raid in the first place? The rewards of course. You could want to raid because of the prestigious titles, unique skins or just for fun, which is a reward itself. After you defeat a raid boss, you will be given a number of magnetite shards or gating crystals, depending on the raid win. Next to that, you will also get gold, a legendary insight, a fragment of the boss you just defeated, which can be used to create a statue in your guild hall, and another exotic or ascended item. Legendary insights are used to craft legendary equipment, but it is also used to show your experience and join higher level groups. I will discuss this later in the video. Anyway, those magnetite shards and gating crystals are a currency which can be spent at a raid vendor who can be found throughout the raid wing or at the Lion's Arch Aerodrome. This currency can be spent on exclusive ascended weapons, armor, trinkets, infusions and more. Magnetite shards are obtained from the wings 1, 2, 3 and 4. Gating crystals are obtained from the wings 5, 6, 7 and possibly another 8 wing in the future. Magnetite shards and gating crystals come in real handy if you want to gear up an alt or if you want to have another set of armor on your main character. But more about gearing your characters later in the video. One thing to keep in mind is that these magnetite shards and gating crystals have a cap each week. You can get up to 150 magnetite shards and 100 gating crystals each week. This gap could increase in the future if ArenaNet decides to release more raid wings. A quick example, if you decide to do wing 1, 2 and 3, that would mean that you would already have 150 magnetite shards. The completion of wing 4 would mean that you won't get any magnetite shards from defeating bosses. However, defeating a boss would still give you that legendary insight and another exotic or ascended item if you haven't defeated the boss that week. So if you're in it for the gating crystals or the magnetite shards, make sure to check your weekly cap before starting a raid wing. You can easily check this by having a look at your currency tab in your inventory. A quick note about rewards is that you can only get them once a week per raid boss. You can still defeat a raid boss if you join another party but the rewards are drastically decreased okay. if you do a boss for the second time in a week you won't get legendary insights that exotic or ascended item or a boss fragment therefore i would advise you to do a raid boss just once a week a new raid week starts at monday depending on where you live for me that is around 1 a.m in the morning on monday since i live in central europe monday is also a great time to start raiding since all raid wings have been reset and everyone is eligible to get all the rewards if you are looking for a party i would try it on monday or tuesday evening Moving on to our next segment, let's have a look at what profession you should play and their difficulty. In raiding, not every profession is easy to play. Some professions have easier builds and rotations than others. Therefore, I would choose starter or intermediate professions when you just started raiding. This gives you more time and space to focus on the raid mechanics instead of your rotation. Depending on the rotation and the role that a profession has in a raid group, I would advise you to start with the following professions. Keep in mind that this list is subjective. If you think other professions are better, please share them in the comments. So, if you are completely new to raiding, I would advise you to go for my so-called starter professions. These consist out of the warrior, the guardian and the ranger, specifically the healing druid. Why these professions? Well, a banner warrior is used in almost every raid setup and has a role of supporting the rest of the team with your banners. It is one of the easier yet important roles that every raid group should have. The banner support warrior has a rather easy rotation that requires a bit of practice for optimal damage output. However, you are mainly there to support your allies with your banners. I made a separate video about this build and other warrior builds, so be sure to check that out if you want more information on the matter. Second, we have the Guardian. Why the Guardian? The Guardian is one of the easier professions to start with if you want to DPS in raiding. There are Dragon Hunter builds that can be used at most raid bosses. That's really nice since this means that you won't have to gear up different professions and won't have to change your build and armor when you're playing a Dragon
Dragon Hunter. A Guardian also has a great Firebrand healing build that can be used in most situations. However, a Druid is still preferred as a healer in most raiding team compositions. Last, we have the Ranger, specifically the Healing Druid. The Healing Druid is used in most team compositions for raiding, especially in pod groups and less experienced groups. The Healing Druid plays a crucial role. The Healing Druid can easily heal up an entire team with just a couple of skills. Also, the Druid brings several spirits which can further buff your allies' damage. The Druid is relatively easy to understand and to master. However, you require good knowledge of the raid bosses since most teams rely on your healing to keep them alive. If you want more information about raiding builds and professions, I'd suggest you watch my best professions video. In this video, I will explain the best raiding builds for each profession. I feel it's unnecessary to rephrase the content of that video in this one, so be sure to check it out if you are interested in raiding builds for your profession. Let's conclude this segment with the most common raid setups. As we have just discussed, the warrior and the druid are used in most team compositions in raiding. However, there are also other professions involved in a raiding squad. Usually, a raiding party consists out of two chrono monsters that provide your team with quickness and alacrity, one warrior to buff your allies with banners and in some cases with empower allies, one druid to buff and heal your allies, and six DPS players. The builds and professions of these DPS players highly depend on the raid boss. Now, if you just started playing raids, this won't make much sense to you, especially as a DPS player. So what kind of DPS should you use on a boss? Let's discuss that in our Raid Wing difficulty segment. Generally speaking, an older Raid Wing in Guild Wars 2 isn't easier than a more recent Raid Wing. For example, Wing 5, where you have to travel to the Underworld and face the Demigod Doom, is significantly harder than Wing 6, where you have to dive into the Mystic Forge and help Zomoros to beat Kadim. So, what kind of build should I use? Most bosses can be defeated with power-based armor and stats. This means that you can use Berserker gear, which has the stats, power, precision and ferocity. This allows you to maximize the direct damage you do to a boss. An example of a power build is an engineer that uses bombs, grenades and the Photon Forge ability to do damage with direct attacks. There are a number of bosses that are harder to defeat with power-based builds and armor. This is usually the case with bosses that move a lot, or when the environment is against you and has many elements where you have to move around. In this case, we want to use a condition-based build. Instead of direct damage, we apply conditions or negative effects to a boss that deal damage over time. Usually, condition-based builds use Viper's gear to deal the most damage over time. Viper's gear has the following stats, condition damage, power, precision and expertise. An example of a condition build is a condition renegade. This renegade build uses torment to damage raid bosses when they move around and the build also uses conditions like bleeding and burning. For a more in detail updated version of power and condition builds, I would suggest to have a look at the Snowcrow's website. You can find the website in the video description. So what should you use where and where should you start? Have a look at the screen. In this case, you want to start with the oldest raid wing, the Spirit Veil. Why? Basically every raider out there has done this wing and it only requires you to play a power DPS if you are playing a DPS. That means that as a DPS player you can basically use one profession to complete the whole raid wing with. Actually, I'm quite certain that your whole team can stay the same for the entire raid wing. No need to change professions. What about the other raid wings? Let me sum that up and have a look at the screen. So. Let's start with Wing 1, the Spirit Veil. Vale. It has three bosses that can easily be beaten with power gear. Then, I would personally focus on Wing 3, Stronghold of the Faithful, and Wing 4, Bastion of the Penitent. These are raid wings that only require power gear and are rather straightforward. The last bosses of raid wing 3 and 4 can be rather difficult to beat, but with some practice you should be able to do it. Then, I would suggest you to go to Wing 2. Salvation Pass. This one has its first condition boss at the end. So if you want to beat that one, get your condition gear ready or condition profession ready. The first boss of Wing 2 can also be hard if you are lacking team coordination. Second to last are Wing 6, the Mithrite Gambit, and Wing 7, the Key of Adashim. These raid wings are rather new. They are also a bit harder to complete since these raid wings also use a mix of power and condition based bosses. The last wing I would go to as a new raider is Wing 5, the Hall of Chains. The reason being, 
is that the boss at the end of the raid is really hard. It requires good team coordination and timing from the entire team. Not just that, the first boss is also rather difficult for newer players since the playing field gets smaller and has multiple elements that can instantly kill your party. So that is my advice in which order you should try and complete the current raid wings. If you have another order in mind or have an additional comment, make sure to leave them below the video. Now we just talked about condition and power based builds, but how should you get this gear and do optimal damage with these builds? Well, let's first talk about gear. For raiding, it is advised to use full ascended armor, weapons and trinkets. However, if you have trouble getting ascended armor, you could also start with ascended weapons and trinkets while the rest of your gear is exotic. I do advise you to get full ascended gear if you can, especially if you just started raiding. The increase in stats does a good amount of extra damage and can make up for mistakes in your rotation. Now how should you get ascended armor? Well, that really deserves a guide itself. There are a number of ways to get ascended armor, however, there are just a few methods that are commonly used. These include completing living world achievements, crafting, fractals of the mists and raiding itself. I would start with getting ascended trinkets and rings since these are the easiest to get, especially the ones with berserker stats. If you have a guild, you can start by participating in guild missions. You need a guild and a couple of guildies to get this off the ground. Most active guilds do them once a week. After completing a guild mission, you can trade in the guild accommodations that you get from participating in the guild mission at the appropriate vendor. You can also get ascended trinkets with laurels. Laurels can easily be obtained by just logging in on Guild Wars 2. You can see your progress of getting your next set of laurels in the achievement panel. Ascended weapons and armor are a little bit trickier to get. You cannot buy these with guild accommodations or laurels. The easiest method of getting ascended weapons and armor is by purchasing them with magnetite shards or gating crystals. But hey, that's a bit hard if you don't have any and you just started raiding. So if you want ascended armor and weapons, I would advise you to get them in Fractals of the Mists, completing specialization collections or by crafting them. Crafting them could be a bit expensive, but by crafting your gear it is guaranteed that you have the stats you want. This is how I got my first ascended armor with berserker stats. I still use it to this day, whereas in Fractals of the Mist you are dependent on the drops from a daily chest. So to sum it up, get your trinkets and rings through laurels and guild combinations and get your first set of ascended armor and weapons through crafting. If you think another way of getting ascended gear is better, please leave it in the comments. Now you got your gear, it is time to practice your skill rotation. Is it important? Yes it is. Especially when you are new to raiding, you want to master certain skill rotations and combinations to better understand your profession and do the most damage. In most cases, you only have 10 minutes to defeat a raid boss, so you want to deal enough damage to defeat the raid boss in time. Knowing the correct skill rotations will not only make you do more damage but it could also make up for the lack of knowledge of a raid boss you haven't done before. Having mastered your profession and rotation allows you to pay more attention to the actions of the boss, your squad and changes in the environment. For example, this Mina, the Solus Horror, the first boss of Wing 5, has a lot of changes in the environment during the fight. If you lack the knowledge of your profession or skill rotation, then you will most likely deal less than the required amount of damage and you won't be able to finish the fight in time. So how do you master your skill rotation? Well, it requires some practice, especially if you are a DPS profession. First, you want to head to the Snowcrow's website or any other website that has rotations for raid builds and navigate to the build you are playing or want to play. Then look for the skill rotation in a video or a written guide. This might look very complicated, but with some practice you can pull it off too. Second, you want to try out the skill rotation on the DPS column in Lion's Arch Aerodrome. Walk up to the arena settings machine and select the following. Adjust self, boons, all of them. Then go to the profession mechanics and select warrior, banner of strength, banner of discipline and empower allies. Then go to ranger, sun spirit, Frost Spirit and Spotter. Up next, you want to head up to the Golem Spawner and select the following. Spawn a Golem, huge. In most cases, you want to select huge. Strong enemy, 10 million health. And then select additional options, add conditions, all of them. And then, last but not least, select please spawn my golem. Also, use the food that is required for your build, else you won't hit the numbers you could get. I know the food costs gold, but it helps a lot to nail your rotation and get a realistic view of how well you are performing. Each build uses a different kind of food, so have a look at what kind of food your build uses and purchase some from the trading post. Why do we select these settings? Well, these settings reflect the most realistic scenario 
when you are up against a raid boss. The buffs on yourself is what you and your squad should be having up all of the time. Mainly the boons, might, fury, quickness and alacrity. Now, last but not least, you want to try out your rotation. Try it slowly and read up on why you want to execute the rotation in that specific order. I know it looks hard, but a bit of practice could get you a long way. Give it 15 minutes on the DPS golem and see how far you have come. Also, I use an add-on called Arc DPS. This handy tool gives you a good overview which skills use the most damage and give an accurate view of how you are performing. Keep in mind that this is a third party application and therefore there could be risks attached to it. If anything happens to your PC or your Guild Wars 2 account, ArenaNet nor myself are not responsible for it. Use this add-on at your own risk. However, I've been using it for years without any problems, so if anything happens it is most likely not the fault of Arc DPS. There is no need to panic if you don't hit the numbers that are shown in the video or on a website. You are new, you will most likely start out in a training group. These kind of groups will not look at your DPS but instead focus on explaining the boss mechanics to you and help you get better at raiding. But it sure helps if you know what skills deal the most damage and what combos deal this extra damage. Now your journey can finally begin. Let's look for a group. If you are new it really helps if you have a group of friends or guildies that want to play raids with you. This makes it easier for you to get a group together and you can help each other explain and Hey everyone, Gillamem here, and today I've got a guide on multiple ways to earn daily gold. Having a daily routine of things to do in Guild Wars 2 is a great way of slowly building up your earnings. This video will aim to cover a variety of ways for you to earn gold daily. You do not have to do all of them, you can pick and choose which methods work best for you and create your own custom daily gold routine. Once you figure out what your daily gold routine will be, all you have to do is be consistent and make sure you can get your daily routine done every day. I tried to cover a lot of methods in this video that can yield a lot of return and require less time to do. This would allow players to have time to do other things in the game after completing their gold routine. I did not include trading in this video as I wanted to keep it to methods that everybody can do. Some of the methods that will be mentioned in this video may require more effort than some. I am going to cover these methods from easiest to most difficult. Hopefully, once everyone is wealthy, we can all practice our wealthy people laugh together. <laughs> oh, beautiful! Login every day. Yep, you heard that. Guild Wars 2 offers a daily login reward. All you have to do is log in and load a character into a map. This cycle is 28 days, with each day offering a specific reward for you to claim. Missing a day will not matter and will not reset your cycle. Your account progresses to the next daily login reward once you log in every day and claim your daily chest. Once you claim 28 days of rewards, the cycle resets again. On the last day of the cycle, there is a huge chest of loyalty reward that can reward you a variety of things you can choose from. You can track your daily login progress when clicking on the chest to see where you are in the cycle before accepting the prize. Here is what 28 days of login yields. This method of low effort gold can be extremely useful to players with multiple accounts. Dailies. The daily achievement tab offers various daily achievements you can do in PvE, PvP and World vs World. Some of these are very easy to do such as gathering or completing small tasks. All you need to do is complete 3 of the daily achievements to receive 10 achievement points and a 2 gold reward. Keep in mind you do not need to do 3 from every game mode, just pick and choose whichever daily tasks are easy for you to do. Guild nodes. Guild halls have gathering synthesizers that can be farmed. As long as you are in multiple guilds that have different level of synthesis output, they won't share cooldowns on the synthesizers. This will mean you can gather in all the guild halls you are in with this method. Gathering in your guild hall or home instance will count towards your daily gathering task if it's included in that day's daily achievement. Player home instance. Having a complete player home instance can give you daily materials to farm and build up for whatever item you need to save for. If you do not have a complete instance, you can ask one of your friends or guildmates to allow you to farm their instance. 
a full instance will have almost every material you can gather from, as well as various core, living world, and expansion currencies. This is another low effort way of earning daily gold. Farming the home instance will not take more than 5 minutes, and in total you can earn close up to 10 gold in a full home instance with 3 garden plots. Daily Ascended There are daily cooldowns on some crafting materials, specifically the ascended materials. If you are crafting an item that requires one of these ascended materials, you want to get an early head start by crafting the ascended mats every day. This is because you can only craft one of these mats every single day. There's a daily cooldown that resets. The cost of buying these items is a lot on the trading post, so by doing this every day, you save time and money. Refining Refining is upgrading your lower tier materials to the higher rank material, such as Mithril Ore to Mithril Ingot or Elderwood Log to Elderwood Plank. Check if refining is worth it by comparing prices of the lower tier to its higher tier item. This will also help save space in your bank and inventory. Alt Parking You can park alt characters that you don't use at various chests in the game, which you can open daily. This is a useful way of using characters that are just taking up character slots. There are many different daily chests you can park them at and you can track which chests give you the best value on the fast farming website. I included the link for this in the description below. A quality of life item that you can use in your shared inventory slot is the prototype position rewinder. For chests that are in difficult areas and are close to other chests, you can use the rewinder on the most difficult spot and then collect the other easier chests before rewinding your position to your original spot that you were at. That means you can just log off and then come back the next day and you'll be at the same spot and repeat the process. Leyline Energy Converter The Leyline Energy Converter is a quality of life item that allows you to exchange currencies you earn in the Haramaguma maps for other currencies, as well as other items such as bags of obsidian for example. Getting this item is easy. All you have to do is kill the Mouth of Mordromoth in the Dragon Stand meta in less than 20 minutes. This item will build your currencies over time and requires no effort other than a few clicks every day. Completing the metas from Hot will give you enough currencies to use this item every day. We are now getting into the slightly more effort daily methods. Some of these methods might just depend on your group as they do involve being in a party or a squad. World Bosses and Meta Events World bosses and meta events can be done with a map full of players, and most of these will not take up too much time. I will not include the entire Silver Waste, or Drizzlewood Coast, or the entire Living World Season 4 meta farms, since those require way more than an hour. I will mention a few maps in the LS4 meta train that you could throw in into your daily routine without having to go through the entire farm itself. For timers on the specific map meta bosses, you can type slash wiki space et in your chat and it will bring up the event timers page on wiki, letting you know the boss timers for each world boss and meta event. The Quarrel The Quarrel is a world boss that will take about 15 minutes at most to fight, and I'd recommend you do this world boss only if you do have the time to squeeze this in. It mostly gives XP, Karma, and a few daily chests that include a different rarity of gear as well as a chance for Ascended Drop. Jahai Shatterer and Jahai Bluffs The branded Shatterer event gives a good amount of Voltine Magic, a currency that can be traded for trophy shipment boxes that give you T5 and some T6. It also gives XP which can go towards helping you gain more Spirit Shards, but on top of that it has a big ticket infusion that you could be lucky to get as a drop. The Crystal Infusion which goes for close to about 4000 gold at the time of this video. Casino Blitz Casino Blitz is a map meta event in Crystal Oasis. This event has a pre-meta before the actual boss, which is just going around and collecting coins. The boss is a Piñata Choya that runs towards you. This whole event takes less than 15 minutes to do, the Piñata boss itself does not have a lot of health, so you need to tag it as soon as it spawns. This meta does not have anything fancy besides some loot and XP, but it does have a rare chance that you could get a festive confetti infusion, which couldn't go up to 10,000 gold on the trading board. Chalk Garant in Tangled Depths Another boss event that gives some good loot but also a rare chance to get a big ticket item, the Chalk Infusion, which can also trade up to 10,000 gold on the trading post. 
the Octavine meta in Auric Basin. Octavine meta gives about 7 gold for just 15 minutes of work. The actual meta can take only 10 minutes to complete with a decent map to 5 minutes of looting. This meta is not particularly that big on earning gold, but the fact that it takes so little time to do makes it a worthwhile addition to this list. You get a ton of Aurelium and Exalted Keys and various loot from opening the chests, and it actually does have a chance to drop another infusion, the Liquid Aurelium Infusion, which values anywhere from 1,500 to 2,500 gold. For all metas that include an infusion, make sure you check your items before you salvage or vendor anything. Otherwise, you might be wondering if you salvage that item by mistake and you'll never know if you were lucky or not. Living World Season 4 Maps As mentioned earlier, I will include a few maps out of the entire LS4 meta farm that you could hop in and out if you do not want to run the entire train. For the full guide on the LS4 meta train, you can check my video on that in the description below. The LS4 maps are mainly to farm volatile magic and XP. The XP which can help give you more spirit shards every time you level. The volatile magic is traded for trophy shipment boxes that gives you T5 and some T6, which are used in crafting legendary weapons. These are the maps you should farm if you have time. Plowadon and Great Hall Meta, both found in the Domain of Istan map. Specimen Chamber, if active, found in the Sandswept Isles and Jahai Bluffs Incursions, which is the same map you can fight the Branded Chatterer in. Biora Marches Ice Shard Farm. You can farm ice shards in Biora Marches by going through the chests in this map. Tekkit has a marker pack that you can download to show you all the routes in this map and you can use the ice shards to trade for volatile magic currency which can then again be traded for the trophy shipment box. The Eldritch Ingots can be used to craft 32 slot bags giving you more space for an affordable price. Daily VM Gathering Nodes There is a guide on all the best and fastest spots to gather volatile magic throughout the game. This farm does require quickness and high mobility to reduce your time. VM can be turned into trophy shipment boxes once again for T5 or some T6. You do need the Glyph of Volatility upgrade for your gathering tools to be able to run this farm. Everything about this farm can be found in the Google document linked in the description below. Special shout out to Grey Wolf Trading Company for creating this farm. World Completion Getting the Gift of Exploration takes time. So by doing a bit of every map each day, you will eventually award yourself with some maps as well as one of the main gifts needed to craft the legendary Gen 1 weapons. Players who run plenty of world completions can get it down to about 10 to 14 hours, but not everybody is a marathon runner. To avoid burnout, I would suggest you do a bit of each map every day until you finally complete it. Strikes Strikes are instanced 10 player content that are meant to be an introduction into raids. There are 7 strikes and players usually do all strikes except forging steel because that one alone takes 30 minutes just to escort a tank. Doing all the other strikes should only take you about 40 minutes with an average group. You can get various loot such as gold, unidentified gear, karma, eldritch ingots, etc. You also earn crystals which can be traded for ascended gear with a vendor in the Eye of the North map. Meaning, you save close to 400 gold on crafting ascended armor just by doing strikes daily. Overall, with the daily strike rewards, you can earn anywhere from 10 to 15 gold for doing strikes. SPVP and World vs World dailies PvP and World vs World dailies can help complete reward tracks which can also go a long way with items you are building towards such as the Gift of Battle Reward Track, another gift that you need for crafting legendary weapons. Reward Tracks can also give a variety of materials along the way to completing them. The time to completing a full Reward Track for these two modes will vary as winning some matches or having an active command in Rover's World that can take towers and camps makes things easier and takes less time. You need a total of 80 potions to complete a full Reward Track from either game mode. Daily T4s Fractals are known to be a consistently good method of farming some gold, so having this in your daily routine can go a long way in pushing the overall gold you gain. Fractals are instanced 5 player content that range from level 1 to 100. Doing the daily T4 fractals should take about 30 to 40 minutes with an average group, and doing the daily T4s alone should give you anywhere from 20 to 30 gold. You get various loot such as unidentified gear, fractal boxes, and even a chance for some rare and exotic loot. 
Bonus, if you are a pretty good fractal player, daily CMs are something you could throw into your daily routine. The gold per hour increases a lot based on your fractal titles. Fractal 42 farm. The Fractal 42 farm is one of the top farms you could do in this game, and even more so if you have some Fractal ranks unlocked. This farm can go anywhere from 25 to 50 gold per hour depending on your Fractal title rank. There are players who run the Fractal 42 farms every day for a minimum of one hour. If you want the complete guide on how to farm Fractal 42s, I included the guide in my description below. And those are all the methods I think players should use in their daily gold routine. Once again, you do not have to do all of them, pick and choose the content that you will enjoy and create your own custom daily gold routine. And once you have your routine, just be sure to be consistent and make sure that you try to get it done as many days as you can. If I missed any other methods that you think should be included, feel free to mention them in the comment section below. If you enjoyed this video, consider giving a thumbs up and subscribing. If you want to get updates when content is uploaded to this channel, you can turn on notifications. And if you have any questions or just want to stop by and say hello, I am live on Twitch on the following days listed here and in the description below. But until next time, happy gold learning and I will see you when I see you. People often ask me how I farm gold in Guild Wars 2 and honestly I don't farm gold. Yes, you heard that right, I don't actively participate in gold farms. I prefer to participate in meta events that grant a lot of gold. Usually participation in these events give you a certain amount of a specific material or a currency which you can spend on something else you can make gold with. So let's have a look at three great meta maps to make gold on. A small disclaimer before we start, I'm not claiming that these are the best methods of making gold, but these maps grant you a good amount of gold without having to grind for it. Also, some maps have been considered gold farming maps for over 5 years, so don't worry about this video getting outdated. Alright, let's start with the latest addition to the gold farming maps, Drizzlewood Coast. Drizzlewood Coast is one of the newest maps in Guild Wars 2 and was added on the 26th of May of 2020 with the No Quarter Living World update. Like all other maps in this video, this map does not have a set time to start, meaning that players on the map control when the meta of the map progresses. The concept of the map is very simple. You start at the southern part of the map and you will have to progress to the northern part of the map. You progress by participating in events to capture all bases around the map. Once you have captured all bases, the last event will start. Drizzlewood Coast is in many ways profitable. First, you have your normal loot and event rewards. Nothing special here. But before you start smashing your buttons during the events, don't forget to pick up a magic find bonus near the waypoint. You can get this bonus for 100 war supplies at the war supplies vendor. If you don't have these 100 war supplies just yet, just do the meta once or twice without the buff. You will get enough of these war supplies after one or two runs. This will increase the chance of having better drops during the events in Drizzlewood Coast. You can then further increase this buff with a birthday booster or food that grants magic find. That's actually good practice for every map in this video. Also, while you are at this merchant, don't forget to declare your support to any of the legions. Collecting accommodations for these legions will increase your standing with these legions. The higher standing or rating you have with these legions, the better the rewards will be. You can easily find what tier of standing you have in the achievement panel. Each legion has its own set of tasks tied to it. But next to those tasks, you can also get these char accommodations by participating in the meta and looting the chests after you have captured a camp. If you progress in these tiers, the rewards will also increase. For example, the Ash Legion gives you a Venom box at tier 15. These boxes contain 100 Venom sacks of different crafting tiers, which you can then use for crafting or by selling on a trading post. Each Legion has their own set of materials. The Ash Legion gives you Venom sacks, the Blood Legion gives you blood, Flame Legion gives you dust, and the Iron Legion gives you claws. For the maximum amount of profit, check the trading post what materials are currently high in demand and declare your support based on that. 
the next thing you want to do is to participate in as many events you see. A big part of the reward system in Drizzlewood Coast is based on participation. It is similar to maps like Dragon Stand in the Heart of Thorns expansion. The more you participate in events, the more your rewards will increase. But also, the more camps the players on your map have captured, the more material chests you will get. Every 10 minutes, you will get your reward based on your participation. In the bottom right of your screen, right above the minimap, you can see when the next reward chest will pop up. To maximize the rewards from this system, make sure to enter the map as soon as the meta begins. This way you can start grinding up that participation bonus and get the maximum amount of profit when the rest of the map starts capturing more and more camps. These chests all grant materials from all tiers. So the contents of this chest could either be between tier 1 materials and tier 6 materials. These could also be very useful if you are crafting a specific legendary or ascended item. The third and last element that makes Drizzlewood Coast profitable are the after meta events. They aren't formally called after meta events but they happen after the main meta of the map. So I will call them after meta events. After you have defeated Nicobar, Vision and Renoa, a number of char appear all over the map. These char are called cash keepers and after you defeat them a storage room will open up. These storage rooms have caches you can open with a cash key. These cash keys can be bought at merchants that spawn right after you have cleared a camp or at the southern waypoint of the map. You can buy 5 of them each day for war supplies, but after you have bought 5 of these keys the price will drastically increase. You also have a chance of getting these keys in chests you get from participation in meta events on the map. Anyway, these caches you open have a ton of materials which you could then sell for gold on the trading post. So doing the 4 things I've mentioned before, magic boost and support, clever event participation and the after meta events will give you a ton of materials. If you do the map for the first time, you will get the earlier tiers of the achievements rather fast. There are rewards tied to these achievements as well, but you can only do them once and they are not repeatable. You will also get char field homing beacons from events and chests you loot. Use these beacons to find lost char supply drops which can contain additional rewards. You can easily do them in between events. The amount of gold I made on this map is variable. It really depends if I get lucky with the drops and whether I get rewards from declaration to a legion. But if I can make a rough estimate and if you sell all materials you get, I think you can easily make between 10 to 25 gold per meta. I know this is a big difference but it's hard to give an exact number. Personally, I think it's also a really fun map and it is highly repeatable. So it stays fun even if you do it multiple times a day. And the next map is Dragonfall. No, stop. Don't click away just yet, because you are going to return in a day leaving a comment how about non-profitable it was. Nah, I'm just making a joke, but Dragonfall is also a very profitable map. In contrast to Drizzlewood Coast, it does not matter when and where you join. You can join halfway through the meta and it can still be profitable. Also, this map is community driven, meaning, like I said before, that other players will start the meta and control when and where it starts. It is not time gated by event timers or anything. The profitable part of the map comes from the volatile magic you collect. Once you complete an event in Dragonfall, it will grant you between 5 to 10 pieces of volatile magic. Usually about 7 to be precise. This may not sound like a lot, but it ramps up pretty quick if you participate in numerous events. Also, everything you kill gives about 2 to 3 pieces of volatile magic. Not all enemies that belong to an event will grant you volatile magic, but about 80 to 90% of the enemies do. We have to make a difference between events here. You have your regular events that are along or on the road which give you standard rewards, but you also have meta progression events. These give you the volatile magic we talked about, but it also gives you a Mistborn key. These Mistborn keys can be spent on Mistborn coffers. Three of these chests will spawn right after a meta progression event. These coffers contain Mistborn mode which can be used in crafting, but in our case, making gold, you want to consume them. Once every three coffers you open, you will get a guaranteed rare item. This is usually in the form of an orb or more mistborn modes. You can sell these orbs on the trading post to make a good amount of gold. You also have a chance of getting the gift of Irene, which allows you to craft unique ascended weapons. If you didn't get that by the thousandth chest you opened, you will get one for certain. That's a nice little fact to know. After the Dragonfall meta, there are a bunch of these coffers you can loot right away. Once again, more loot you can sell on the trading posts and more Mistborn modes you can consume. But after the meta, there is more. Stick close to your commander because he will lead you through a number of champion events. Every champion will then spawn additional Mistborn coffers. 
once again, loot all of them to maximize your profit. You will eventually run out of keys, so make sure to participate in as many events during the meta. This way you won't run out of keys at a fast rate. Once you are done with all of that, make sure to salvage your greens and blues and consume your Mistborn modes. Sell your exotic items on the trading post and now it's time to put that volatile magic to good use. Run up to the Mist Warden Quartermaster near the Pact Command Waypoint. At this vendor you will spend your volatile magic on trophy shipments. Depending on your drops you will make a profit or a break even. Combining this with the Mistborn coffers and doing all the events this can give you about 10 to 15 gold on an average run. There are reports of people, especially in the farming community, that make about 30 gold per run. Check out the description for that reddit thread. And in terms of volatile magic you earn between 1500 and 2000 pieces. It's definitely worth your time. Oh, and a few tips beforehand. Don't forget to get the Karmic Retribution and the Empowerment Bonus to get more Karma and Spirit Shards whilst playing. The last map should not come as an unexpected one. It's the Silver Wastes. The Silver Wastes is one of the best options for new and free-to-play players. Also, when people tell you to farm the Silver Wastes, they don't usually tell you the whole story, what makes it profitable. The concept of the Silver Wastes is also very simple. There are four forts with numerous events tied to it. The events all revolve around the idea of recapturing it and protecting it from Mordrum enemies. Nowadays, Guild Wars 2 players refer to the Silver Wastes as Reba. Reba stands for Red, Indigo, Blue and Amber. Each of these forts represent one of the colors I just mentioned. If you see Reba in a Looking for Group tab, you know you have found a Silver Wastes meta map. To maximize your profit, you want to participate in every event of every fort very briefly. Therefore, you must be quick. Getting one or just a few kills in a fort event is enough to get the reward of these events. It is wise to use a mount if you have the possibility. If you are a free-to-play player, consider using a profession that can provide a ton of swiftness or has a lot of mobility. For example, use your shouts on a guardian or use your infiltrator's arrow on a short bow whilst playing Thee. Completing the events I just mentioned will also give you shovels and bandit skeleton keys. You can use the shovels to scan for bandit treasure and then dig them up. Once you have digged them up, you can open them with your bandit skeleton keys. Also, you will get a perseverance buff when you participate in events in the silver wastes. This buff can give you a plus 30% magic find and can stack up to 5 times. This will increase your chances of getting better loot. So your participation in events is very important in getting a ton of loot. After all Reba forts have completed their events, the forts will collapse and you will have to take out a number of bosses at those forts. Then the Vine Red spawns and you want to participate in this event too. The end chest of this event also gives you some nice loot. This along with the Perseverance buff will significantly increase your chances of getting better loot and will last if you stay for the next round of Silver Waste. So on your second run of the Silver Wastes on the same map as before, you will have a higher chance of getting more and better loot. And now it's time to follow your commander again. The commander will usually walk a specific route to dig up bandit chests. Once again, digging up these chests with 2 or 3 magic find buffs will increase your chances of getting better loot. The coin purses you get from these events contain crafting materials which you can then sell on a trading post. You could also open the coin purses on a lower level character to get gear that matches the level of that character. You can then salvage the gear to get crafting materials of a lower tier. In some occasions, lower tier crafting materials are worth more than higher tier crafting materials. For example, linen scraps, a tier 4 material, are worth more than silk scraps, a tier 5 material. A run of the silver wastes can grant you about 10 to 15 gold per run. There have been reports of people making 25 gold per run, but I would not consider myself that lucky. It all depends on the drops, which you can always increase with magic find buffs. In terms of time, I think the Silver Wastes has the shortest meta. Most players have known this map for years and there is always a Reba squad in the looking for group panel. Definitely a good map for free to play players and players with the expansions alike. So what do these three maps have in common and what makes them profitable? First, there are side achievements or rewards tied to them. For example, the Silver Wastes has the magic find buff based on participation and this while the Drizzlewood Coast map 
has an allegiance you can pledge to and progress towards a ton of achievements. Second, they are all community driven. You can hop in at any time and the community decides when the meta starts. You don't have to wait for a specific time to start farming. Third, participation is profitable. For example, higher participation in the Drizzlewood Coast leads to higher rewards. And higher participation in the Silver Wastes leads to a higher magic find. And fourth, the longer you stay, the better the rewards. Again, the Silver Waste gives you a magic find buff after you have defeated the Mordron Vinewrath. If you decide to do another run of the Silver Wastes, you have a chance of getting better rewards. Also, the after-meta events in Dragonfall and the Drizzlewood Coast are very profitable if you have enough keys, which you can farm during the main meta event. Fifth and last, you decide what to do and what to spend it on. You can choose multiple paths on each map. You don't have to do the same events over and over. You can do events in the west today and do the ones in the east tomorrow. And all of this while you are still making profit. Also, you decide if you want to sell your materials and loot or if you want to keep them to craft ascended or legendary gear. I hope all of these will help you farm the gold you need for the item you want. Also, let me know why you are farming gold in the comments. And as per usual, don't forget to give this video a like, subscribe for more Guild Wars 2 content and share this video with your guildies if you think it was helpful. Thank you all for watching and I hope to see you all in the next one. Peace. My job doesn't offer health insurance. With the new law, I found an affordable plan and only pay $47 a month. New law, lower prices, more people qualify at healthcare.gov. Well, it is time. Currently, as I record, it is December the 31st, the very end of 2019. If you guys don't know, once a year, I tend to produce a video like this where I have a look at my Guild Wars account and everything that I've done so far on it as the years go along. So you can kind of get a recap for all the new patches that came out, such as, for example, I'm on the Dragon Stand map, which didn't exist last year, and all the personal progress I've made as well. They're usually really fun videos and sort of point out a lot of the content in the game most people end up skipping over. The uh, very interesting thing about this year is it's kind of a very different format of Master. See, for the first seven years, up until this April of Guild Wars 2, I always did everything for myself. The fact that I'm covering the game on YouTube videos and have a very sizable audience, and the fact that I even cover games a little bit on Twitch, didn't really want to impact the kind of stuff I had on my account. Basically, I never took donations.